Yeah, good afternoon. I hope, I hope you have enjoyed the day so far. Thanks for coming. I would like to pray first and then we are going to start the topic. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk about how to how to create creative learning processes for our young people in our churches. We invite you that you may join us and lead our conversation and help us to discover these opportunities that that we can use for building up your kingdom. Please send your Holy Spirit to us and help us to discover what, what he is teaching us today. This is our prayer in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So our topic, topic for this afternoon is creative learning processes in teams. As an introduction, I would like to tell you something about the background, how I come to this topic. So I used to teach in Hungary in our seminar, Practical Theology, Counseling, and also Psychology, Introduction to Psychology. And uh, once I started a, a project, a research project, because I'm very much interested on mission and also on counseling, uh, I combined both. Uh, and uh, I raised a question, how do we teach people? What ways are the most effective ways of teaching, actually, the gospel? Because I had the feeling that but uh, very often we use just one main way of teaching, which is a, a cognitive uh, process. Just uh, teaching through lectures, through preachings, through Sabbath school. And this is not the most effective way of teaching. So we started some researches. We analyzed our projects, um, mission activities. I talked also to quite many people who came to our church through different kinds of activities. And uh, we came to the, uh, con to the, to the con conclusion that uh, teaching people to cognitive ways is not the most effective. There are many more, much uh, more effective uh, processes. So we also design some projects using different ways of uh, learnings, like uh, social learning or learning through models. And uh, one of uh, those projects is, for example, the Friends Camp. Um, we are also running now in Germany. And um, in the Friends Camp, we are using um, this kind of creative learning processes. So I would like to start with a Bible text uh, as an introduction uh, to the topic. And uh, this is in uh, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1, 2, 3, and also um, uh, 32. I don't want to read all the text because this is a genealogy. Do you like these parts of the Bible? Reading so many names and a list of um, names you, can, you can't even pronounce, you know. These were the men who came to David at Ziklag, while he was banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish, and they were um, uh, warriors who helped him in battle. And then we see a lot of names here, um, people who could fight successfully against the enemy. But in verse 32, we see something interesting. Uh, we, don't have, we don't only have the list of names, but uh, the writer stops here, when he uh, reached the name Issachar, um, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. These were very special people. They were not fighting with weapons. Um, the writer doesn't record their abilities how to handle um, sword or whatever. Uh, what was their special ability? The, the writer is mentioning here. They understood the times and knew what Israel should do. They recognized what to do and they, they, they know what to do. And the chiefs, 200 chiefs, were listening to them. And uh, all their relatives were listening to them. These were wise people, actually. They knew what to do. It is not, only, uh, it, it is not always enough just to follow a certain kind of tradition, what we always have been doing. But we also need to listen to our times, recognize uh, what's now... Um, uh, going on and how should we adjust our our activities and I just wish that we could learn something from these people here because the times are changing also now and uh, we are struggling as a church to survive you know and uh, it is important to discover that that uh, religiosity is dying in Europe <coughs> tens of thousands of people are leaving Christian churches in Europe so we try to reach them and teach them we are using so many devices you know, channels like um, television channels, uh, satellites, or internet, or whatever. We are printing books. We try to teach them. We try to uh, tell them something about Christian values. But how are we doing this? Are we doing it effectively? 
uh, are you satisfied with the results how we are doing this so we need to understand the time and and also think about reflect about whether we can do some changes actually um, there is a study about the causes of regions decline in Europe there are three major reasons why uh, regions are declining in Europe and and these three major uh, reasons are quite interesting for us one is the modernization process uh, we need God less and less and we have more and more uh, secular devices not uh, necessarily connected to religious matters this is the process of secularization and modernization um, hundred years ago whenever people had problems like um, uh, problems with uh, depression or questions about meaning of life or whenever they got sick they went to the church they went to the priest and the church was very much relevant if you read uh, the first uh, century Christianity um, uh, the reports about it we see that uh, everything was common they came together daily and they shared whatever they had um, and uh, the church was just uh, important for everything in the life today why do we need churches what is the church church offering what specific uh, uh, programs or, or values do we offer in the church preaching teaching explaining books very little fellowship less and less fellowship not a miracle that people are leaving the church because they find meaningful uh, alternative activities outside of the church and the second is this enchantment of religion lots of faith connected experience even if people come to the church they don't don't get to know Jesus Christ or God very often they are here among us we try to tell them and teach them something they live without changing their lives because they didn't meet Jesus Christ or there's a very little connection to experience of God um, what we observe very often that is just how people behave and do and uh, that means the, the way how we try to um, talk to them about Christian values is not enough for them to experience something uh, with God with a supernatural being and the history of the Christian churches just look at the Second World War and the history uh, priests used to bless weapons you know and they were praying for for victory but, uh, of, uh, on each side of the war so the, the the Christian churches have a very much problematic history it's not a miracle that people are not satisfied with present Christianity so we need to change something but it is difficult to change you know in the next chart you see actually uh, this is a uh, a chart about about uh, how we can uh, what we can do about changes so here is you see the current uh, reality of for example we can talk about our young people in the church and the church is doing so many things to to impact their life to influence their life so the parents are teaching them Christian values and the church is teaching them Christian values and the youth in the church is influencing them youth leader and so many other other activities are present in the church uh, in order to help them to to move a bit towards a preferred future what is our preferred future what is our goal with young people so how would you describe this this preferred future what are our goals why are we teaching them, to them into a relationship with yes into a genuine relationship to Jesus Christ what else To get involved also and in integrating the church life and how are we doing we see that there are also other uh, powers working against it you know uh, like studying music sport activities internet social media and they are working against it so you are preaching in the church about the relationship to Jesus Christ what are they doing why they are why you are preaching maybe they are connected to the internet by by their mobile and they are just uh, looking at, um, at the Facebook you know they are reading some messages so you see that uh, the inhibitors so uh, working against your influence they can just destroy whatever you are doing you know and we need to ask a question uh, we are doing so many things here like never in the history we are we are having so many devices and tools and books we never had but the impact you know is very little upon upon our young people and we just uh, need to ask the question um, what are we teaching 
and what do they learn out of it? What is the meaning of teaching? And I just would like to uh, show you a, a graphic here. Uh, teaching and learning, the relationship of teaching and learning. We are busy with teaching, but are people learning something out of it, what we are teaching? You see that there's a part, uh, you see here, uh, what is taught but not learned. Uh, we are preaching and teaching, but young people are not learning it. You know, this is a quite a large portion, I think, of, uh, out of uh, what we are doing. In the second area, you see here, what is both taught and learned. They implemented it. And the third area is, you know, we never thought anything about it, uh, but they learned something without teaching them for that, you know, uh, for better or for worse. You never know. For example, have you taught your young people how to use Facebook? Are they using it? So they learned it somehow outside of, of, of your area. So there are so many things, you know, outside of the area. Now, if we uh, ask questions about about how we are doing our teaching work, uh, implementing values or, or teaching values in the church, we see that about 50 to 70 percent of uh, Adventist uh, young people are actually leaving the church. Uh, they are not accepting values we are teaching, although we spend decades for these values, te in de teaching these values. They accepted just very little out of it. They leave the church and they they lead a life like they would never, they, they, they would have never um, visited a church, actually. So they have learned, learned something else here, what we see. They learned something else uh, without uh, um, the involvement of the church. Actually, in northern Germany, I know that this is uh, about 64% of young people who are leaving the church. I don't know your countries. We are an international group now, but in Europe it is maximum 50% we can, we can reach, but I think very few countries can reach about 50% of their young people. So we see that quite many are not able to learn, uh, or not, not learning, not accepting Adventist uh, values or Christian values. And here we have a, a group of people, 30 to 50% of Adventist young people, who are uh, not only uh, receiving teaching, but uh, they also learn uh, these values, and uh, we can consider um, actually um, this process as quite effective. But there is also a question: uh, Is baptism a sign for accepting all the values, all the Christian values the Bible is promoting? Um, I doubt that we can consider it as uh, uh, successful just uh, because some people get baptized. Even after baptism, quite many people leave the church. So we can conclude that. Uh, how the way we are doing actually um, teaching and uh, and uh, um, um, proclaiming our values or Christian values is not the best, um, uh, and uh, we could we need to think about how we can do it uh, more successful, more effectively. We have the truth. Have you got it? You know, you know what it means. We try to tell them. We try to teach them. We try to explain to them, but uh, it doesn't function. So I would like to talk about the cultural context, um, uh, which is influencing very strongly also the way how people think and are able to receive um, any content. So in the modern time, uh, we saw that uh, faith and in reasoning was important. They, people used to have one big story. They had an orderly word. They needed explanations and they needed rules. In the postmodern time, people are different. You know, faith and reasoning. We have learned as Adventists, we need prophecy, we need arguments, we need proofs in order to come to faith in God. And uh, the way how William, Bill, William Miller uh, presented, for example, his lectures, that was reasoning uh, uh, through uh, presenting Bible texts and comparing them with the history. If you do that today, what is the reaction of young people? You can reason, you, you have so many arguments, the history never had so many arguments for Christ and Bible. What is the reaction of young people? Not impressed. Not impressed. They don't even want to listen. Yeah. The question is, okay, you can tell me that, but I, I don't feel anything about it. I don't experience it. Because they are experience-oriented, not teaching-oriented. Uh, reasoning is, is playing a different role now. You know, experiencing is a, a much better way today how people learn something. But why don't we design learning processes uh, 
uh, so that they can experience something. Not, not being told, but uh, that experience something. I can tell you something. Uh, there are some, uh, some uh, universities now. Um, for example, in Finland, there are some people uh, developed a new system of teaching people, for example, business science. I want to challenge you a bit. Um, there are two business people. Both of them graduated. One went to a, one of the best universities, had classes uh, from the, with the best professors for business, and graduated with excellence. And the other one graduated, but he went to the university. Professors never taught any class prof properly. He graduated without any examination. Which one would you take or trust more? The first one. Who would trust more the, the first one more? Busy. Who is the second one? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you want to know the story behind of this? Is it true? There's a new school now, for example, um, uh, Team Academy. You can Google it, Team Academy in Finland. Now this is growing. Actually, Team Academy has a, a new principle. They don't teach people in the classroom. They don't or offer classroom time cognitive way of teaching. What they are doing, uh, let them experience something, let them grow. Also in teaching business, the way how they teach business, you apply for the school, you pay the school fee, you know, you get registered, you come to the first class and the teacher walks in and says, this is the first class and also the last one. You know, let's talk about the business. You have come here to run business, is it, to learn how to, to run a business. Is it true? Yes. You get an assignment, you need to build groups, and you, start your own, you need to start your own business. You get a coach, a supervisor who is going to coach you, help you not to make big mistakes, you know, but our goal is with you within three years of time, when you, you, you get your bachelor degree, you know, you will have experience, not only experience how to run a business, but you will have your own business, earning your own money within three years of time. So they have to go to the library, they get a recommendation of about 1,500 books. Each of them annotated and recommended. If you want to uh, know this and that, you need to check this 110 books. You know, each book is annotated and also uh, marked uh, how, how important they are, how, what is the, how value, valuable is the contribution of the book to the, to the topic. And they go to the library and they need to set up, what do we need to run a business? They need to find the topics, you know, by themselves. Then they get a list. And the coach comes in and, and, and looks at it. It's okay, or you need, he tells them, you need to work a bit more on it, you know. And they run a business, they establish a business, they have to earn money. You know? And three years later, uh, by graduation, the graduating, uh, actually, graduation happens after they, they, they run the business uh, successfully. So back to the first question. Is an excellent guy, visited the best professors in the classroom, but they never established a business, you know. And the other, at the other side, you have these guys, they never went to good professors, but they were coached and they established a successful business already by graduation. Which one would you trust the more? So I was told last, uh, last week I met some people from, Plant, uh, from Team Academy. All of them are, are very much enthusiastic and they said, Students who learn business with them, they have a better average in running business and earning money than people from Oxford or Cambridge learning business science there. What is the, exp uh, what is the secret of this method? They are not teaching through a cognitive process, but they have people to become a team, to discover whatever they need, to develop their skills and abilities together under the supervision of a coach and uh, they come to the point that through experiences they will manage uh, to, uh, to achieve their goals. One big story or my story. We used to teach about great con controversy, which is a, a very important topic. But today if you start preaching about it, um, what are people asking? It's okay, it's nice, yeah, but where are you in the story? What is your experience? What is your life story? And what is my story? So they ask. Uh, the question, how I can get involved in, into this, uh, this matter? What is, what is God doing with me? And where is my life in this, in this whole story? So they want to get involved. They want to also uh, have a holistic approach to the world. Um, I used to, uh, we used to teach uh, 
and uh, many many things about the world order, you know, commandments and how we should uh, behave and so on and so on. But today people think differently. They don't want to separate, for example, church life and private life from each other. If I believe in God, I believe it. I believe in God also in my job, you know. But in the modern time, we saw that we went to the church. Um, that was part of our, our life. In the church, we were singing, how great are you, God, you know. And we left the church. We, we, we were hiding the Bible because that was a, another period of our life, outside, living, the li living outside of the church, you know. That meant uh, I'm not talking about God. Well, so we don't, uh, we don't uh, join both parts together. But today, that is different. I used to have some young people coming to me um, in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, most of them uh, grew up in the church, uh, but they were about leaving the church, actually. And whenever I have a, a group like that, I try to build a small group with them, a team, which is my method of, of dealing with them. If people come to me and they say, oh, I'm struggling with the faith issues, I have a problem, I ask them, do you want to talk about it? We can sit down, we can talk. Uh, and if the answer is positive, I just ask. So can I also invite some others? You know, so we created a group. Most of them were, were struggling with, with faith and, and life issues. And um, we created a, a team, actually. We became friends. And um, I eat with them together. And I, I use also creative ways of teaching. I will give you some more exp examples about it. But we eat regu uh, reg uh, together regularly. And once we were eating together, I asked them, what is your favorite pizza? They grew up in the church. What do you think? What was the favorite pizza? Not vegetarian. Oh. Yeah. Pizza with bacon. Margarita. Yeah. Not margarita. One said, ah, I like. Ah, shall I give you an honest answer or a polite one? <laughs> yeah. I said, oh, of course. We are talking here openly. You don't need to pretend anything. And the answer was, I, actually, I like pizza with bacon. Yeah, pizza with bacon. Oh. Not pepper. Oh. <laughs> that is pork meat. Yeah. And I was a bit surprised. I didn't ask. What do your parents think about it? You know. And I asked the, the second one, and and you? And she was la laughing. Uh, yeah. And she said, oh, me too. <laughs> pizza with bacon. You know. Almost all of them said, okay. I said no. I don't, I'm not, I'm not that one, that's not my pizza, but I didn't say that I, with some, so we just talk about it and, and if we consider these answers, we see a big problem here, orderly world, the way how they lead their life is problematic, we consider it, is it true, as Adventists, they are eating pizza with bacon, so we told them not to eat pork, you know, uh, to, to care about head, is it true, there, there are some problems. But at the other hand, so people who t uh, today who think holistically, um, if they have an experience with God, they are connected with God, uh, they act also differently <coughs> than modern people. These young people were struggling with, um, with um, our standards, Adventist standards, but they enjoyed the meeting here in this, in this um, uh, group together. Each time, I think six or seven or eight, eight weeks long, each time we met, they invited a friend or a classmate or, or someone else outside coming not, not from a church background. They, brought, they always brought friends to the meeting because they were en enthusiastic about it and they told about it uh, to their friends. They were doing, for example, one was doing karate you know, and uh, while they were exercising, the other one asked him, what are you doing tonight? And, and uh, she said, I'm going to have Bible study. You know, he was that. But she was explaining that enthusiastically what it means for her to come to this meeting. You know, and the uh, other one asked her, can I join? It seems to be interesting what you are doing there. Each time, we see we have church members here. They don't eat pizza with bacon. But, and they don't, don't bring friends either to, to church meetings. Here at this, hand, at, at this side you have young people struggling with, with Adventist standards. But they invite friends to the meeting because they think holistically, if I like it up here, 
if I like being here, I also invite my friends there. You know? And they are not afraid, for example, posting on Facebook pictures about their own baptism. Mm -hmm. How many are you online on Facebook? Uh, you have an account. How many times have you posted pictures about your own church? With you, standing in a church. <laughs> Self is in the church. This is the church, this is me. How many times? I, I have baptized some young people last year, you know, and I was just interested on it. How do they manage these pictures? Almost all of them, they posted the picture of baptism with Bible text. This is my text I received for my baptism. They are enthusiastic because they want to think holistically. It must be integrated into my life. So uh, that's a different process, you know. Explanations, we used to have explanations through preachings, and today try and discover. That is the way of, of uh, learning. So if you want to teach something important, it is better to, to establish a process, a learning process, where they can try and discover. Do you have children? Yeah. Do you have children? You want to teach children not to make mistakes. Is it true? Sometimes they answer, ah, let me try my own way. Is it true? Let me try. You have tried it. Why don't you let me try it? You know, even if they make mistakes, so try and discover. We used to have rules. They are integration oriented. You know, not uh, to having rules, but uh, they love integration. And that creates a, a very special um, situation that we see here from John Scripts of Sec, a conversion identity. It is available on the internet, a PDF. You can download if you if you Google for it. He has published an article about conversion and identity. I recommend the article, read the article. It's one of the best articles written by Adventists. And he's describing the situation. We are coming as a church from 19th century Protestant America. You know? And uh, we, we used to do mission in terms of doctrinal identity. To, to listen, to discover, and to accept doctrines. That was actually important. But now we are living in the 21st century world and the culture is different and the attitudes are different you know and what we need now that is mission in terms of spiritually authentic identity spiritually authentic identity what is the difference between uh, both of them here you had doctrines ten commandments are you ready to keep them or not now here is the question how is your relation to, to Jesus, Jesus Christ what did you experience are you authentic sometimes um, People growing up in the 19th century in a mission and, uh, or in a doctrinal and having a doctrinal uh, identity, um, we come to the church meeting, we sit there, although we are struggling with God, we are having problems. What are we doing in the church? What are we doing in the church? We still have ties, jacket, we sit there, we smile, because for us, it is important to care for the doctrine. On Sabbath, I must be in the church. Although I have, prob I have problems with the church and God and with everything, but I want to keep the doctrines, doctrines. What are young people doing if they have some problems with God and with spirituality? What are they doing? Are they coming to the church? They want to be authentic. You know, If I don't love it, I don't go there. Is it true? They, they don't want to be like us. And, we expect them to keep these doctrines. You must be there on the on Sabbath, you know. But they are different. Um, how can we teach them values? Our our ways of teaching are doctrine oriented. Giving Bible studies, for example, uh, that is that is doctrine oriented, you know, and not spiritually authentic, uh, and not 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 necessarily um, um, supporting uh, spiritually authentic identity. So we need to change some ways how we teach values in church. And our church is now in this crisis, actually. Uh, we are coming from the 19th century, and we are singing songs from the 20th century, but we are living in the 21st century. You know, and the 21st century is different. And what is uh, the Seventh-day Adventist faith tradition helping us today? We need to ask the question and also answer. But I think if we go this way, we need to change our ways of dealing with things and, and teaching things. For example, if I, I have young people coming to me and they tell me, oh, I have decided for baptism, I want to get baptized. Are you ready to prepare me for baptism? I say, yes, oh, I'm glad about your decision. But I never start teaching doctrines. 
I drew a line, and uh, there is one point I would like to see. And this is the question about motivation. How is his motivation towards God? Very often people decide for baptism because they were touched by something. Uh, they were impressed, and they decide for baptism. But uh, they are not having a spiritual, authentic identity. Even if I asked him about, bapti about baptism, why do you want to get baptized? What are the reasons? What kind of reasons have you heard about it? What are the reasons young people want to be baptized? Because my friend does it. My friend? <laughs> yeah. My parents? My parents? I want to make my parents happy? Italian. Yeah. <laughs> Eh, io mi sono battezzato non per gli studi biblici ma perché ho accettato la salvezza e volevo essere salvato anch'io. Gli studi biblici sono venuti in un secondo tempo. So biblical studies came later. Yeah. Thank you. What else have you heard about the motivation of young people for baptism? I love Jesus. Yes, yeah, genuine one. Some said, I know I, I need to do it once. Yeah. Yeah, it's part of the story. There are others that say, uh, I have been searching for the truth and this is where I found it. Yeah. I also had some young people, they said, um, I want to be baptized and asked him uh, uh, why. And uh, they say, something touched me. The last time we had a youth meeting and the, the sermon touched me. And I asked him, and how is uh, your relationship to Jesus Christ? Uh, can you talk to him? And uh, one said, uh, um, a girl, she was about 16 years old, she said, I don't know. It doesn't function at all. Mm -hmm. But I, it, it touched me, you know. I was encouraged to get baptized, even though I had some struggles with God and questions and doubts, but I was told, it's not, it is not a problem for God, I can be baptized. Uh, what is the problem here? So we told them the importance of baptism on this way, but uh, we, we doesn't have people very often how to develop a, a genuine relationship to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So if I have something like that, I organize uh, small groups and teams. I try to bring together some young people, uh, four, five, six young people, because I am in Germany now. In Germany, I'm not uh, working that uh, intensively in the mission, but I still have my connections to Hungary. And I go back regularly, even last weekend, I was at home to Youth Congress and preaching there. So we, uh, we organize on Facebook some groups. And whenever I go home, we meet and we sit down, we discuss, we eat together. And what I do is the uh, following. I would like to teach them new values, um, spiritual experiences, <coughs> and help them to uh, discuss, uh, develop um, a new identity in Jesus Christ. I have one person, you know, uh, a baptism candidate, and this person decided for Jesus Christ. And uh, I ask questions, um, how is your relationship to Jesus? Um, what about your prayer life? And mostly what, what do they say if you start talking about prayer? Ah, it doesn't function very well. I don't know how to deal with it, you know. They usually have a problem with prayer. Now I could offer some sermons and Bibles about prayer. But... Uh, Actually, my problem is, I'm the pastor, the way how I learned how to pray is about 30 years old. About 30 years old. And if I start teaching a person like that, it is uh, difficult to, to create a bridge. Because uh, I know if I start talking, it, I'm very much actually doctrinal oriented. What I do, uh, I try to find some other uh, young people, maybe two uh, person who were baptized and two new people who are on the way. And uh, I look for someone who had an experience with God and, uh, and uh, developed some prayer habits and activities and this person is enjoying uh, uh, praying to, to God. And I, I invite him, uh, you know, um, you said that you have problems with prayer. I know someone here, you know, this person has just developed, you know, something interesting. Uh, in, in, his, in her prayer life. And uh, recently I had some, one person, her name is Anna, and her name is Laura. And the story was I just connected both of them with each other, and we also had a regular meeting. And I requested her in the team, please help her to discover something in her uh, prayer, prayer life. 
and she started teaching actually Laura uh, about how to pray. What is the telling her here? If, if the pastor comes to her and requests her, could you assist me please in teaching this person uh, about prayer? What, what is it telling this person here? What is it expressing? Trust. trust. What else? It's trust. Not the pastor is doing it. She was also asking, why don't you do it? I said, you have made some genuine experiences a yeah, couple of months ago. I think it's very much important. What, what else is happening here? Give her responsibility. The responsibility, yes. And I'm also using, she's a spiritually authentic uh, person here. She's enthusiastic about it. She's motivated. Whenever she's teaching, she's presenting a model that is functioning today uh, in her generation. And she started teaching Laura. And within a couple of weeks, she, wo she became very much enthusiastic uh, about her prayer life too. And then she started praying and, and, and talking to Jesus and, and they became very good friends. They didn't know each other before. I connected them to, to each other. Uh, we organized uh, summer camps, the friends camp in Hungary. And uh, the next time after they experienced it, I asked them, you know, we have quite many non-Adventists there. These people have, don't have any idea about what it means to pray. I need someone to conduct a workshop about prayer, how to pray. She was 15 and a half, yeah? and she was about 16 years old. You know? And I asked this group here, um, is there anyone who would uh, be ready to conduct a workshop about prayer? We have about 400, non uh, 400 people at the Friends Camp in Hungary. About 150 to 200 people are not members of the church. Very high responsibility to conduct a, a workshop about how to pray. Is it true? Would you give them the chance to, to teach people how to pray? Would you do that? <laughs> Remember this, this example. A business person taught well in the class, never having experience. And someone, never having a lecture about business, but being professional in the praxis, you know. They have the experience. Why don't we allow them to use this team or use a small group setting in the, in, in the friends camp to, uh, to teach others also how to pray? So I coached them and they did it. Actually, they did two workshops. She did how to develop a, a, a relationship to Jesus Christ and she talked about how to pray. And they, they run two creative workshops. Now she's thinking about to become a pastor. No, uh, she was not yet baptized by the time she did this workshop in the friends camp. Now, uh, last year I baptized her. She's very much enthusiastic, and she's already preaching in the church. She's now 18 years old, you know, but she she's uh, preaching in the church on regular basis, and she's teaching Sabbath school lessons with 18, you know. And that is a an uh, example how to design, for example, uh, creative ways or or authentic ways of learning. So uh, some German people know this, know that uh, Nürnberger Trichter. So that is the uh, time when uh, we, can, we cannot use this method anymore. If you don't know anything, just come to Nürnberg and we will put it into your head. You know, we will teach you, we will tell you, and you will understand it. Uh, that time is over. Um, something else is needed. I just like these uh, quotations from Albert Einstein. Uh, logic will take you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. Logic will take you from A to B. We are using actually our logic for designing uh, a teaching process or learning process. Explanation, teaching, conducting classes. I think as a church we need to, uh, we need to reduce uh, the heavy load, heavy teaching load in the church, uh, which is a cognitive one. And we have to uh, understand what also Einstein is, is uh, emphasizing, his imagination and creativity is very much important. For example, helping people to, to discover the Bible. We are using uh, this, this uh, option to use the uh, imagination ability of people to, to read the Bible. i just give you an example. In the Friends Camp, we have developed a very, very simple method of helping people to discover that the, Bi uh, the, Bi that the Bible can be an Enjoyable, enjoyable book. These are some non-Christians, and if you give them a black book in their hand, they won't like it. 
I guess. So we invite him to read the Bible, but we don't tell him that it's a Bible reading time. What we do, actually, we want to help them to imagine something they have never seen. Um, we, in we invite them into a room like this, or a bit larger than this, and we have about six, seven, eight stations in the room. And um, if someone enters the room, he has to remove the shoes and the eyes will be covered. Can't see anything. And we call it blind theater. Blind theater. And um, he enters the room and doesn't know anything about what's going to happen. You know, of course, they heard about it quite many things. In this room, we have different stations and each station is telling one story of Jesus to these people in a bit different way. For example, so one, one station is uh, uh, when Jesus was sleeping in the, in the ship and um, a storm came and you, you remember the story, yeah? And uh, Jesus was sleeping and the, the disciples were afraid and they just called Jesus, get up, don't you see that we are in trouble now? So how does it look like if we read this story? Um, that eyes are covered, we invite this person to a station and a storyteller can start telling the story. There's a team caring for these people. And the storyteller starts telling the story. There's one voice for Jesus at all stations. Other persons can be changed. And um, he reads that uh, they got into the ship and um, they wanted to go to the other side of the, of the lake. And Jesus uh, was sleeping and then the storm came and the boat, uh, the, the, the ship started sh uh, shaking, you know. Two strong guys just lift up his chair. And he's just sitting, uh, sitting there and uh, the eyes are covered and two guys just lift the, sh uh, the chair up and they start shaking the chair. Uh, what's happening actually? If you don't see, you, you need to use, you are starting using your imagination. You see the story, you get involved into the story. Uh, he wants to put down his leg, but there is a basket with cold water. That's why they have to remove their shoes. You know, there's a basket with cold water and he pulls the, the leg back. Hey, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, and um, then Jesus um, uh, wakes up and he just uh, commands to the, to the storm, to the wind, calm down. And uh, all the noises, the background noises, uh, we calm down, you know, and he's experiencing something out of this peace of Jesus is giving to people. We design a process like this. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes. We are telling the stories of Jesus. It's a very creative way of of presenting stories of Jesus and people are just getting involved. When we started, some people were laughing about us. Oh, does it function or not? Or they were just doubting. But I tell you, we started using this method about uh, 11 years ago. Each year, this program is the most wanted program in our friends camp and also in other programs. Because it is very creative, we change the process each year. We need to rewrite the story. You know, and uh, if we put, we start the camp meeting on Monday evening, if we put the list, you know, um, outside that you can register for this meeting Monday evening, and we spend a, a week there until uh, Saturday night, they can, uh, they can uh, participate on this program. On Monday evening, all places will be taken. Monday evening. Everybody is waiting for this, uh, for this option, and, and they want to just, uh, just go there. What, what is the secret of this? Because we are working with, with the imagination ability of people, like Einstein saying, that in order that they can experience something out of it. How can we design creative learning processes, actually, um, which are different, not just um, uh, telling people some principles that are important? I want to give you some, uh, some uh, suggestions here. First, we need to design a learning goal. What do you want to teach people? Designing a learning goal. That means not choosing a Bible text, but you need to de decide what do you want to achieve. For example, once uh, I was working with uh, quite many people together at a camp meeting, and uh, each day we had a certain task, a certain goal uh, we wanted to achieve. And one day we had the goal, for example, uh, we want to help people to learn what it means to trust Jesus. Trust in Jesus, that was the goal of the day. And um, we had to design all activities for this goal. We are not preaching a lot, but we are designing many different kinds of creative activities in order to help people to 
to discover what it means to trust Jesus. I can give you one example, for example, my favorite one. In the evening, when it became dark, I invited all the people to the forest. It was, there was a huge forest nearby. Uh, you could go 20 kilometers in one direction without uh, finding any, any village or, or city. I invited people and I requested them not to have any flashlight. Um, um, uh, and uh, about 240 people came to the forest. And um, I told them, you know, today the topic is uh, uh, learning how to trust and we would like to, uh, to help you to discover something out of it. We will go into the forest and have a walk about one, one and a half hours. So you need to be at so small groups and we will send you into the forest. You know, each group one by one, we will send you into the forest. And then they started complaining. Are you crazy? You know, there are more than 200 people here. You send them into the dark forest, you will lose people. And I said, okay, we are quite many people. We can afford it to lose someone. It's not a problem. Um, but you know, if, if you want to learn how to trust, you know, you need to take risk because it is part of the learning process. Is it true? If you don't never take risk, you never learn what it means to trust. Of course, no one left. So we sent people into the forest and, and um, uh, what they didn't know actually, that uh, before they arrived in the forest, we walked into the forest and we designed uh, the path they, they were supposed to walk through. It, it took about one hour, one hour, 10 minutes, walk in the dark forest. At each location, they could go in the wrong direction. There was a, one person hidden in the forest, in a bush behind the tree or in a hole or somewhere. So the people started walking in the forest. They didn't say anything. They were just listening. It was silent and dark, you know, looking for which way to go, you know, in the forest. And whenever they turned the wrong direction, you know, they, put, uh, they did two steps in the wrong direction. A silent voice came out of the nothing. That's the wrong way. Turn right. The first time they heard it, they were scared. Can you imagine? The forest, you know. And they were shouting, hey, shut up. What, what was that? Have you heard that? What was it? You know, they started talking. And they were walking for about one hour in the forest. They didn't see anyone from the people. They just heard the silent voice guiding them. At the end, uh, we were waiting for them at a certain place. And with each group, we spent about 15, 20 minutes just talking about the experience. How was it? Did you learn something? Some people said, this is the first time in my life I discovered what it means to listen to the silent voice of my conscious. Some other people said, once we were standing at the junction and the voice didn't come. And some started praying, Lord, help us to, to hear the voice. <laughs> you know, and then it's a good time to give Bible study for 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the forest, in the dark, you know, after having an experience like that, you know, and then we prayed with them together. Mix normal teams up. It's also important to, to break up the normal teams and, and uh, build new teams. Make the environment as informal as possible. Church setting, for example, the main hall of the building is not the best place because it is not informal. It makes it difficult to, uh, to be yourself. It is better to go home or go outside or meet a room or something. Make an informal, uh, uh, choose an informal an, an environment which is informal and has people to relax and, and participate. Support people to realize their potential. So team learning uh, has the goal actually not to present what you want to teach them, but to help them to discover their own potential which is very much important. Uh, that means you are giving uh, a bit responsibility to the people here, and they can grow through me making mistakes sometimes and, and through challenges. Uh, recognize and celebrate achievements, rotate leadership in the teams, and support people to be successful learners, confident individuals, responsible members, effective contributors. Support them in order they can grow. This requires actually a different kinds of leadership type. This is a non-directive leadership. You are not the one who is commanding, who is teaching, who is explaining. You are the creative one who creates an environment which allows people to grow and, and to experience, experience something new. If you have questions, just raise your hand. Or if you have comments, you know, just raise your hand and I can stop. So designing learning goals um, 
it's very important. What do you think? What kind of learning we can you can talk about some examples. What kind of goals would you choose for young people? What do you want to teach them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, how to connect with other Christians. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's the toolbox. How to discover faith by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, this how to are very important because we want to prepare them for life. Is it true? We don't want to just give them some books <laughs> for life, but to, to give them some experiences. You know, and we need to prepare them for, for life. Yes? La verità nella Bibbia è un divertimento sano. The Bible, uh, the, the truth in the Bible is a uh, very healthy uh, uh, way, uh, hobby, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The truth in the Bible, yes. yeah. Uh, what is your impression? Are your uh, young people reading the Bible? In my own local church, yes, we are very uh, curious about the Bible and they look at, uh, for it. Mm -hmm. I think there are some differences if you talk about Bible reading. It depends upon the, the motivation level of young people. Yeah. There's a certain level of motivation. If the motivation doesn't reach this level, people are not reading the Bible. Is it true? They don't pay attention. You can preach, teach, give books, whatever you do. They are not interested. From this point on, the motivation is enough uh, to help them to discover it is important for me, and they do it. They start reading. But young people are not uh, uh, born here on this point. Is it true? We need to help them to reach this point. And actually, what we do, we tell them, you must be at this point or beyond. You must read. Is it true? We are teaching them expectations. You must be beyond this point. But who is telling them the process? Who is guiding them, escorting them to grow to this point or, and beyond? You know? Because that is not nature that someone is just uh, getting excited about the Bible. He needs to experience something. So what I'm talking about is, is very much important for this part. You know? But we, oh, now that some people also for back, even after their they baptism, they lose their motivation strongly. So that's why we need to, to think about learning processes we are designing. If people don't reach this point, you, know, uh, you cannot use deductive way of learning. You know? From this point on, you can use deductive way of learning. That means teaching, you know, and presenting, giving lectures. Uh, before that, if you use deductive way of learning, which, is, which requires actually attention and motivation, what is going to be the reaction of people? Please come, sit down, I want to tell you something, I need one hour. What is the reaction of people? Yeah. When can we eat some pizza? Yeah. Yeah. Bacon. So we, we need to learn, we need to learn to, to cope with this period here, actually. That's why we need more creative learning processes. I'm not talking against uh, Bible teaching, if, if the motivation is there, and we need to do that. But for example, uh, giving Bible studies. Uh, this is the process of giving Bible studies. Here in this period of time, I don't talk about 28 beliefs. It's not the right time to, think, to, to teach about 28 beliefs. No? Here I do. <coughs> you can teach about 28 beliefs and, and, and Bible truths and whatever. Here that is not the right time. What do I do here? I invite them to, to have a, a, a journey with me together in team. You know? We create teams, we eat together, we sit down together, and I try to design creative learning processes. <coughs> For example, if we read the Bible, we used to read the Bible and explain people what the Bible text means. In this period of time, if I read the Bible, I don't explain them the Bible. 
We do it regularly through Skype, for example. We also read the Bible, we discuss about the Bible. How, how do we do that? We read different translations. I read one translation, someone else reads another translation, maybe two or three translations, and then I ask them, if we are um, in a group, you know, who could, uh, who could tell me the story what we read in the Bible with his own words? Uh, that is his own translation, you know? And someone out of the group tries to, tries to summarize, you know, what is in the Bible text. You know, and uh, uh, I request them not to use any word that they, they read in the Bible. They have to use different kinds of words, you know. And then they need to think about it. How can I express something that I read in the Bible with other words? They are thinking about it. But also this method requires quite high motivation. Because if the motivation is not high enough, people are not participating and they don't, don't, uh, don't cooperate. No, but this is also one way how we do that. Understanding young people, I would like to talk to you about, this is the second part, about um, the environment and how young people think um, in today's society. There are some researches I just want to summarize. I don't, uh, we, we don't have time to talk about it too much. But uh, there is a study, Mindset uh, 3.0, it is available online also. So you can download, this is Viacom uh, Brand Solutions study about young people uh, in German society, but I think it is a very good example for, uh, for uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, secularized Europe. Um, the results of the study um, can help us a lot. It is not a, not a Christian study. So their purpose was not to assist Christians, but to assist uh, companies in order they can sell their products uh, much better. But the results are very interesting. Why am I presenting this? We need to look at the society and understand it. Um, if we understand the way how people think, their needs, it helps us to design also a learning process they can accept easier. So the first question I would like to quote from this study what are you doing in your spare time? Um, several times a week. And here you see the list, internet surfing and chatting, uh, to listen to music, uh, watching TV, uh, listening to radio, uh, being together with my partner, uh, meeting friends, family, uh, I don't do anything, just doing nothing, and so on. Um, do you recognize something out of this list? Media. The influence of media, the first four positions, you know, uh, media. So we need to also think about why are they consuming media that much, young people? What is important for them in the media? Um, they were also asked here, um, that, that was the, let's see the conclusion. Um, researchers said that we can recognize that free time is actually um, reserved for media, con consuming media, actually, uh, for young people. Uh, free time is uh, time, uh, time for media, but it is also time for social life, because we, we see internet surfing and chatting, chatting, that is also um, an interaction. Listening to music, music is also um, uh, uh, connected to social life. What do you think, how is that connected, listening to mu music? How is it connected to social life? I am listening my music at home. Music gives you identity. It's identity. If you listen to certain yeah. music, you belong to a special group. Yeah. There was a question in this study. How do you get your music? What is the way of getting music, new music? Yeah. Through friends. Friends. Music is part of our uh, sharing, giving and taking, you know? It's part of, of the life. I want to listen to the music you like, you know? I'm just uh, wondering. This is the number one, actually. How people get new music, you know, to listen. To friends, recommended by friends, you know? Um, now the second question I find interesting. What do you enjoy the most out of these activities you are doing during the week? And here we see uh, meeting friends, you know, listening to music, having sex, chatting, uh, and uh, being together with, with partner. So I would like to talk a bit about these three items here. Um, meeting friends, this is the number one. 
what does it tell you actually? This is the most important activity, not chatting, but it's here. Internet surfing or ch uh, chatting. It's, here is at the first place is meeting, that is real meeting with, with people. So what do you think? Why do they spend that much time with internet? If that is not the most important for them? What do you think? Because there is nobody to meet. Really. Yeah, it seems to be that they, they cannot meet each other as often as they like. Mm. So it is just a, a solution for uh, creating a bridge to yeah. other people. Replacement activity. Yeah. Replacement activity, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That means they have a, a desire to have more time with friends together mm -hmm. uh, to develop my social life. You know. And uh, there was a question friendship, what is needed? You know, if you want to have friends, what is important for you? And, and the answer was, um, if someone is my friend, we need to uh, sit down, be, need, need to be able to sit down together and talk face to face. Talking face to face, not chatting, not, not through internet, but uh, talking to each other, laughing together, being available, you know, through email and, and phone and whatever, you know, uh, having common, common interests. It's important. That means actually um, they want to have people, you know, um, they can meet and sit down and, and talk. And also here, uh, what is uh, the most important for your own life? If you think of your future, what is the most important for you? In the first place, what they said, uh, to have friends I can trust. You know, having friends I can trust, you know. Having a partner I can love and trust, you know. And uh, the third one. Uh, to be myself, you know, just to uh, to be authentic, to be myself, not uh, not to uh, um, create facades or masks, but to be myself. And, uh, these are three. What is the telling you about young people's desires and about the world? Authenticity, yeah, friendship, in real setting, coming together, sitting down, desire for actually teams and, and fellowship with others, you know, trust, you know. music, here you see, why do you listen to music? Um, I listen to music which is according to my mood, you know, and then I, I started thinking about it. Um, we Christians, we are just neglecting feelings of people, is it true? There is no, no place for feelings, where can you express your feelings, you know? To music, you can express your feeling. You know, you adjust your feelings, to, to your music to your, your feelings. But what about the church? You are sitting just there. Where can you laugh or, or cry or, or discuss about your struggles? So we need to have some, some place where people can express their feelings, you know. Because music plays an important role, actually. Uh, this is the, the answer number one. Uh, music is part of my life, you know. Uh, through music, I, I can present who am I, you know, through the identification, through some music style, I can also present who am I, this is where they answer. Uh, where do you get your music? Friends, you know, this is the answer number one. I get music through friends. About sex, for example, uh, the survey also tried to get answers to questions. Why is uh, sex playing that important role in the life of young people? And um, um, the answer, because I enjoy it, you know, only five people said, um, uh, f uh, five, five percent of the people said, uh, I do it because I enjoy it. Uh, most of them, they, they have, a, uh, uh, for most of them, sex is having a deeper meaning. They want to have uh, intimacy and, uh, and, uh, and closeness here. And, uh, that means actually also it is very strongly connected to social life, desire, desires actually, to be myself, to be accepted, to be loved, having intimacy with someone. That's it, and that shows us that young people are actually learning, uh, uh, the, having a desire for, uh, for deeper intimacy, fellowship, uh, social life, interaction, uh, meeting face, uh, face to face. We also need to think about in the church and, and ask questions, what can we do for it, you know? And uh, an answer, a possible answer is for me, having small groups in the church, also designing learning processes, actually in teams, in, in small groups. Um, and this helps young people to, to, to learn new 
um, uh, ideas um, on a way which is not borrowing, they can accept. What is learning? Measurable and relatively permanent change in behavior through experience, instruction, or study. And here I would like to emphasize very much experience. Uh, learning through experiences, not just through uh, presentations and instructions. You know, and um, there are two ways of learning, the traditional <laughs> way of learning and team-based uh, learning. You know, traditional way of learning, the instructor is seen primarily as a dispenser of information. You are teaching, you are responsible. And if the, if the people are not listening, what is your conclusion? I am not doing a good job. And it, is, uh, it, it makes it difficult, actually, uh, for you to, uh, to achieve something. Uh, the presenter, the instructor, is slowly responsible for ensuring that learning occurs. Mainly a cognitive process is this, which is not very well uh, appreciated by young people. Traditional um, uh, learning versus team learning. The team learning is a bit different. The primary issue is empowerment to give the means, ability, or opportunity to do for people. That means, for example, if I come back to the example here, um, if someone would like to learn how to pray, you know, I create a team for this, for this group, uh, for, for this person. I create a group, and uh, I try to connect people with each other. We can also come together and, and, um, and set up uh, uh, or start uh, different kinds of activities, walking together, going outside, eating together, discussing, uh, modeling, there are different ways of learning. <coughs> if half of the group is not an Adventist, not Adventist or not Christian, other half of the group is Christian, we are doing things together like walking, going outside. For example, in the Friends Camp, we have about 400 people coming to the Friends Camp in Hungary. About 150, 170 uh, people are not members of the church. What we do actually? We build small groups in the Friends Camp. Uh, everybody is part of a group of eight to ten people, and uh, half of the group comes from the church. They are church members. Half of the group are not church members, and uh, we we design creative activities with them. For example, I hire a lot of boats. Um, what is boat? In English boat. Yeah, and uh, uh, about ten people can can be uh, in the boat, or maybe I just show pictures about it, what we did. 10 to 15, 20 people can be in a boat and we design activities together. You know, we teach them and uh, we tell them some rules. How can we survive? Uh, how can we achieve something if we are sitting together in a boat, you know? And they need to accept uh, certain rules. This is team building, actually. And uh, um, do, you need, do you know this, this kind of, of boats here? No, this is this is a dragon canoe. We call it dragon canoe. You know, we have about 15, uh, 20 people in the canoe. You know, this are one team, and we designed the whole day's activity um, uh, on this way. Actually, half of them are not Adventist; other part of uh, them are Adventists, and they don't talk about uh, faith issues. We request Adventists don't talk. We design the program. You just uh, cooperate with us. And if people start asking questions, you can answer questions, but you don't need to raise questions or, or talk about issues uh, people are not asking. But we spend one day together, preparing, working in team, you know, and working together and going together and eating together, you know, having fun together and uh, challenging each other, like here. You know, we, do you know this type of activity here? Uh, we use entertainment pedagogy also. Um, relying upon each other. We spend one day together, second day together, you know. From the third day on, there's almost uh, no hindrance to talk about also uh, faith issues because we became almost friends, you know. And through observing us, the way how we work together, you know, um, they, they start trusting us and they start asking questions. Um, and then from, the, from Wednesday, we start on Monday, for example. From Wednesday on, we can uh, talk about uh, faith issues on Thursday. Also on Friday, I can pray with almost anyone uh, out of these 400 people. Uh, from Monday to Friday, through working together, through spending time together, through social learning processes, 
even without talking, there is a learning process taking place, which is called social learning. You, know, you are together, and, and at the end, you can sit down with them, talk and pray together, and, uh, and get also feedback and also uh, give some inputs. Back to uh, team learning, empowerment is important. Focus on, on the abilities of a group working together. So we would like to uh, assist people to develop different kinds of abilities through group uh, uh, ministry. That means also we need to challenge them, not just letting them be in together, but we need to design some programs uh, for them, how to challenge them in order they, they can grow in their abilities. Uh, interaction of people learning from each other as well as from the task at hand and uh, observing others in action is very much important observing others in action collective problem solving and experimentation questioning assumptions and reviewing outcomes as a group observing others in action for example if i know that i have we have some people uh, in the friends camp who are having problems with something We always have also atheists coming to the friends camp, and they don't want to. Uh, they don't want to talk a lot about God. Uh, some of them they they want to go home the first day, for example. They don't come to sermons. They don't come to presentations. They don't want to talk. They want to enjoy life and have fun together. Uh, what? How can you design a learning process for them in order they can grow and, and accept something? And, and become open. How would you design a learning process for them? If you start teaching them, they don't listen. Asking questions. Asking questions, yeah. What, que what questions? Questions about life issues, uh, maybe uh, of existence. Mm -hmm. For example? When the business you, you're in mm. collapse, uh, when you lose friends, whatever, things like that, mm. bank crashes. Yeah. It is a good approach, but uh, my experience is if they are in a Christian environment, they are very much careful about not giving the chance uh, to enter discussion. Because that is not what they want. Mm. Is it true? And they know. Whatever topic I talk about, my purpose is to come to the topic of, of God. You know, is it true? <laughs> and uh, some of them, they, they are just hesitating. Shall I go home or not? So what we do, we just add some other people to the group, like this here. Maybe former atheists. Former atheists. No? They were like they are. No? And we tell them, don't do anything. Don't ask questions, don't talk. We design different kinds of activities for you. You spend three, four, five days together. You know, eating together, challenging them, you know, putting them under pressure a bit, helping each other, you know, uh, doing many things together. It takes three, four days, you know, and, uh, and they become friends. Something is, is happening there because uh, how can you preach the most effectively Christian values? What is the way of preaching Christian values the most effectively? Giving a good example, yeah? giving a helping hand whenever it is needed, you know? uh, understanding people, the way how you behave is teaching Christian values. And uh, after a while they get connected, they become a team, um, they start to develop friendship, you know, and while they are working together, struggling together, eating together, it's just a matter of time that we become open and uh, start question, asking questions or, or just uh, uh, be open for discussion. We also had some people in our friends camp, uh, we saw they came to the meeting on the Friday evening. They didn't participate at any uh, spiritual program. No. They were one of one lady, for example, was sitting sitting just outside under a tree. Whenever we had a meeting, like a, a short sermon in the morning, 
or in the evening, 20 minute sermon. She was sit sitting under the tree and, and waiting, and she joined us. And uh, she participated at actions, but she never participated at any meeting. But we always um, uh, went to her and we cared for her. For example, um, during the sermon time, sometimes I just walked out of the tent and I was sitting with her under a tree, talking to, to each other about just anything. And uh, on Friday, uh, until Friday, she, she got to know uh, quite many people, maybe eight to ten people, and one of them asked a question to her. I don't know what she asked. I tried to find out because that, what, that one single question changed her, her attitude. Friday evening she came to the meeting, to the sermon. On Sabbath afternoon when we had a baptism ceremony, she decided for baptism. But before Friday evening she didn't come to the meeting. So these are certain dynamics happening actually in a team. No? Uh, and also, Jesus was using these dynamics because he was together with, with 12 people and he designed uh, certain learning processes in team. And we also need to think about, um, about the effectiveness of learning. If we are just talking to people, you know, they, might, uh, they might remember about 20% you know, of what you have been talking about. If they see something, they remember a bit more. Um, if they hear and see something, they might remember about 50%. If they are talking about something, they might remember about 70%. But if they do that by themselves, by themselves, they will remember about 90%. That means it is an advantage to design different kind of creative activities for learning uh, something, for teaching something. They will remember it if they participate. If they do it, that means you shouldn't do it. Design it so that they can participate. And if you do it, actually, if they do it, you know, they will learn it more effectively. But becoming a team is a process, not an event. You cannot just say, um, from tomorrow on, we will be in teams. We create two teams and um, please come and we can, we can do something together. What is the price of, 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 uh, of uh, creating a team? Disponibilità. Availability. Availability. Exactly. Availability. Time. Yeah. Interest. Genuine interest in people. And not to have too many friends. Put yourself a stake. Meet this in Yeah. What else? You also need to love the people. Because sometimes they are a bit difficult, yeah? Like we are. Amare, amare l'altra persona che è di fronte anche se non la conosci. Love the one who's in front of you even though you're not knowing you didn't Yes. Yeah. And if you start a team with young people, with five, don't don't take more than five, six maybe, you know, uh, you need to, to continue. Don't do this, that just for two weeks or two, two months, you know. Uh, you can invite them, create, uh, start different kinds of activities and uh, you also need to uh, think about how I can uh, I can uh, um, present God's kingdom uh, the love of Jesus to these people there are some basic questions we need to answer if you want to have a different kind, kind of learning process we, are, we were talking about not just cognitive but also social learning and other type of learning process I want to present you three questions and and then we, uh, we can try to uh, think about how we can answer these questions. One question is, how can we create an environment where people experience God's kingdom even today? So usually we have, we have Bible study meetings that we want to teach. But how can we create an environment where people experience, experience God's kingdom even today? Now I would like to challenge you. If you would be part of a, of a team, what should happen? in that team, in order you think this is like king, the, the kingdom of God. What should be present in that team? What should happen there in a small group where you would have the feeling, oh, it's like the kingdom of God here. I like it. Friendship. Trust. Yeah, trust. How can you trust someone? 
how can you develop trust? You have uh, spent time together and experienced that he's a person I can trust in. He, is, he, he, he does what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, trust. Mm -hmm. We design actually uh, some activities through entertainment pedagogy uh, to develop trust. Mm -hmm. Design activities where they have to learn to trust each mm -hmm. other. There, were, there are some very simple activities that are also a bit complicated. Mm -hmm. So um, running a project together, mm -hmm. I need your assistance and you are there, you know, and you, you develop trust through creative activities, not just listening and teaching and eating together, but going outside, doing something together, mm -hmm. being challenged uh, uh, together, this, this create, uh, tr creates trust. I do that also with my children, for example. Um, my son is very good in sports. I uh, asked him regularly, what is your desire? What do you want to do with me? No, and uh, two years ago, he said, we want to, I want to go with you uh, home from Germany to Hungary by bicycle. So going home 1,100 kilometer in one week. You know? And if you do something like that, what's, what's going to happen? You know? This was an excellent time for us, actually. What's going to happen? You need to work together, cooperate, assisting each other you know, caring for each other, you know, presenting love, encouragement, you know, and celebrating success together. So why don't we do that more often? Yes, <laughs> and pushing the pedal. <laughs> yeah. How can we create an environment where people experience God's kingdom even today? How can we become authentic, not just looking professional, but much more being real, um, presenting models, not sermons? You know, this is a second question. How can they become authentic? Most young people have the problem with the church because they don't feel the church is authentic. No. How can you become authentic? How can you manage it? You have a team of five, six people. How can you be authentic? For example, if they see how you manage failures. Pastors must be perfect. Is it true? But you are not perfect. No. So we need to manage together. We, we need to present how I manage failures and, and problems in my life. Yeah. It's also important. Um, and I, I present an authentic uh, relationship to Jesus Christ. I, present, I talk also my, about my struggles, about my joys. Uh, they can observe me. No. How can we address all different senses in order to avoid cognitive overloading? You know, people have different learning styles. Use all of them if possible. Yeah. Cognitive o overloading means uh, that um, uh, you present too much. For example, presenting the 28 beliefs. At the end, you ask, ask the person, are you ready to decide for baptism? What happened? Uh, I'm just experiencing cognitive overloading, what it means. For example, if I present in a Bible study group, you know, 28 Adventist beliefs. In six months' time, I teach them all 28 beliefs. Do they remember everything I, I talked about? No, it's cognitive overloading. I ask the question, are you ready to decide for baptism? What is the answer? Oh, it was too much stuff here. I don't know. I cannot keep everything you, you mentioned. I don't even remember everything you mentioned. You know, I work also in Africa, in Tanzania, among Maasai. I love them very much, and we run some projects. But I learned something. Cognitive overloading happens there very quickly. If I tell them two, three, four things at the same time, for example, go to the shop, buy for me a, a SIM card, then go to the uh, fundi to a carpenter and pay the bill then please um, go to uh, go and buy some petrol for us you know it's cognitive cognitive overloading I taught him three things what's going to happen with these three items nothing it's too much it's better to tell him first go to the shop buy something for me and come back and then the second after he accomplished it go there and do this you know oh, also here in the church, people are listening to so many, sermon, so many sermons and teachings and lectures without implementing them. So at the end, they don't change actually anything in their lifestyle. 
because cognitive overloading happened. That means we need to give them a chance to to work, work on it. Whatever they have learned something new, uh, it is good to have a, a small group setting where we can discuss it or, or observe how we are dealing with this issue, how we are implementing it, giving a good example. Our problem is sometimes in the church, we teach them something, you know, we go home, they don't see us how we are implementing what we have been talking about. My question um, aims at what you're doing with these persons after they leave the camp, because the camp is a, a exceptional setting. We don't have that setting in the mm -hmm. churches. Uh, so this is my question: How do they fit now, or shouldn't they fit in the in the church? What do you do with them after mm -hmm. that? So actually, the same principles we are using also lo in local ch church settings. With some local churches, also in Stuttgart, I was uh, the last year. Um, a local church can create the same setting. You, you, you can organize a weekend and you spend outside or you, you, what you cannot do uh, to accomplish all this on Sabbath morning in the church. It's impossible. So don't try to put everything we are talking about in Sabbath morning. You go there to the church and you tell them, uh, I have learned here in Pazmit. You should stop preaching to people. You should uh, cover the eyes, you know, <laughs> and so on. That is not the right place. I think if, you, if a local church would like to, to, to work um, with the system, um, you, you need actually to have friends or people whom, with whom you want to start a process like this. You need to create small teams, small groups, which is independent from camp uh, meeting setting. You, know, you can do that also in, uh, in the, your local church. And you need to do that on a regular basis. You know. We organize also weekends with people from, for example, Thursday to, to Sunday, people, and we do different kinds of activities together. In the evening, we get tired. Also, for example, skiing together with people. Also, uh, next from Sunday on, I am going to have a time with some young people from Hungary who are not yet Adventists, you know, skiing together. My purpose is actually, I would like to help them to, to decide uh, for Jesus Christ, you know. And we created a small team. We are about eight, eight people you know, involved in this. And we were skiing together. I will teach them a bit about skiing. In the evening, I'm sure we are going to have time for discussion and do something. You know. And we are going also to, to design some activities, skiing activities, which is more just than, than just skiing. You know, we use creative elements also if you are skiing. So is your, your main goal just to bring people to the decision to to get baptized and be a follower of Christ without be, being a member of the church? Or do you aim at that, that they become involved and integrated in our church? This mm -hmm. is my question. So yeah. is this kind of a, a movement now going beside our churches, our system, or you mm -hmm. think it is possible to, to integrate mm -hmm. them in our existing system? I, I think we cannot separate uh, this, uh, these two issues from each other. Like uh, being member of the church being responsible for other people, you know, and, and connect, being connected to Jesus Christ. You know. uh, our purpose is, like I, I said here at the beginning, for example, uh, right at the beginning, even before baptism, you know, even before baptism, they should learn how to do ministry for others, teaching others how to pray, helping others to, to discover what it means to read the Bible. You know. And they discover, and these people here, she's, uh, both of them have been baptized, She's preaching. She's now 18. She's preaching in her church, local church, regularly. Yeah? And she's integrated very well. And she is now um, 17. Actually, she, she is thinking about uh, to study theology, you know, and becoming a pastor. So uh, baptism is, is just an event, actually, but it doesn't stop a pro the learning process. You know, in the second workshop, I will... I will talk about young people, about statistics uh, concerning young people's uh, conversion, and we will see that one problem area is after baptism, we stop teaching our people, or young people. That's their feedback. We stop teaching them. Before baptism, we care for them, we teach them. But after that, we don't do anything for integration and teaching or for growth in faith and also within the church. So this is, all, this is also our responsibility to to help them to get integrated and to do a meaningful ministry for others. And this is possible only in a church setting. Because if you are just a Christian and living your life alone, 
Um, how can you use your, your skills and abilities for building teams and, and community? It's not enough. Yeah, that was a short time for a big topic. One last uh, um, slide here. I would like to quote from Paul Hebert, Integrated Approach to the Study of Humans. We see that um, uh, these areas of human life are equally important, like spiritual uh, life, social life, cultural, biological, physical, and psychological uh, part of our life. Uh, which was the most important for Jesus out of these six? Yeah. Center. Which which one? But he always he always focused on one of these. Social. Social? Are you sure? Social. Yeah. I don't think social was important too. Theological. I don't think. Always the one which was which was relevant for the person he was talking to. Is it true? Always the one area, the area which was relevant to the people, to the person. Jesus was reading too. Yeah. That means sometimes people had uh, uh, physical problems. He was not preaching, but he was healing, you know. Or they were having social problems or also cultural issues. Always he, he understood the situation of people and he related to them. We need to do the same actually also in our churches to discover it. Yeah. So we can add the which is the seventh? Individual. <laughs> Individual. Individual. Yeah. So we come to humans always from the side which is the most important and which is the most relevant for the person. Yeah. Um, sometimes we try to, to connect people through this one single way, speech, your life, uh, cognitive process. We want to teach you how to believe in God and, and so on, how to read the Bible. It is not important, uh, not not the only way, and it is not only. It is also not the the most effective way. Sometimes, for example, social life, eating together, yeah, like a conversion of Zacchaeus, yeah. Uh, how how many m minutes did Jesus spend in preaching to Zacchaeus? Uh, they were just eating together. So this is also part of the story. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, rispetto alla situazione della mia chiesa, ci sono dei ragazzi eh, che sono voluti uscire fuori. In my church, some youth have uh, decided to go out. Um, con loro era stato fatto questo lavoro di creare gruppo e amicizia. With them, we had performed uh, this kind of work of creating a uh, group, a team, and uh, friendship. E um, adesso diciamo la difficoltà forse è quella di passare allo step successivo, quello dell'aspetto spirituale, come agganciarli da questo punto di vista. Now maybe uh, we are having a hard, uh, we are having a hard time on uh, how to put them from a spiritual perspective. Perché alcuni da piccoli erano in chiesa. Because some of them when they were uh, small children, they were within the church. Poi l'hanno mm. lasciata e non ne volevano sapere più niente. Then they left it and they didn't want to know anything about it. Quindi mm. adesso apprezzano il gruppo, ma nient'altro che riguarda il Dio. Now they do appreciate the group, but they don't want to listen to anything else that the group that are God's called. Cosa dico a fare? So what, what could we do about that? So the question is actually about faith development. Yeah. What can <coughs> the question is about faith development. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, something we can do and something we cannot do. We, we, cannot, uh, we cannot give faith to people. Yeah. It's impossible. But what we can do, we create an environment where faith can grow. If we create activities, uh, regardless how creative we are, but if we go out, we eat and teach and whatever we do. But if we separate these activities from, from faith issues, it is not an environment where faith can be developed. Uh, faith issues must be 
uh, just nature a part of the whole story. I think sometimes our young people have problems with faith issues because we were pushing too much at the beginning. And at the end, they present an allergic reaction about, about such uh, inputs from the church. But it was not a nature process of, of creating an, envi an environment the faith can be developed. The question is, if we do secular activities like eating, going outside, watching movie, how can be your faith part of it in order it can contribute to the faith development of others? Okay. I think we need to present actually values of the kingdom, not in words, but through different kinds of actions. Yeah. Like uh, genuine interest listening to people, relating to their needs, you know, praying for them for their needs, you know, reducing expectations, but increasing support. You know? Because sometimes yeah, if I expect I would like you to come to the church. Yeah. I would like you to make a decision. It is putting pe people under pressure. I'm not giving them something, I am expecting something. It's better to turn it over you know, and have people to, to do steps by themselves. My son is doing sport and he's very good in, in doing sport. And he, he, he was invited to many championships and he, he earned many medals. And, but um, at one moment he was growing he reached a point, all the championships were on Sabbath. He could, he could be a professional uh, sportman. And how do you teach them not to go to championship on Sabbath, for example? Or you just let him go? You know? If I tell him, please don't go, what am I doing? I am taking the responsibility. I am your father. I express clear expectations. You know, and uh, I expect you to obey. You know, he's going to reach um, the age of 18. What is the reaction of, of, of the children? Yeah, now I am a grown up person, I want to do whatever I like. So, we, we didn't tell him, Please don't go on Sabbath because before that, we had a lot of inputs, you know, as parents, and we were praying, and I told my son. Please make your decision. I will accept it. You know what I, I think about it? You don't need more teachings. Please do it by yourself, the decision. And he said, I go to, to the next sport uh, uh, championship. And he was struggling with the issue. Then he said, no, I don't go. Later he said, I go. And I don't go. Each day he was changing, struggling with the issue. And two days before, before the championship, he came to me and he said, Dad, I don't think it is right to go to the championship. I don't go. That was the last time he was struggling with the issue. I never had to discuss again with him about, about this issue. That was his decision. And it is important that we let people make their own decisions. You know? But we should have these inputs, you know, presenting something which is... A, which is a, helping them to, to discover God's kingdom, how, how it is. And I think that is the best way. It is difficult way, of course, because sometimes we need to just uh, wait and be patient and struggle because we see that people are making mistakes. Yeah. It's not very easy. Well, thank you very much for your attention. The time is over. So God bless you, and I hope you have enjoyed it. You know?